Good morning. Glad to see you. And I am going to jump into Malachi. We've got this week and next to talk about the book of Malachi. This is the last book in the Old Testament. It is the last book before uh, the really the fulfillment of everything the Old Testament looks forward to in Jesus Christ begins. Uh, so Malachi is going to end with the, uh, the promise of the coming of Elijah, which is really John the Baptist. And uh, Jesus says that. Jesus tells us John was the fulfillment of that. And so that's how really the New Testament era begins with the an announcement of the birth of John the Baptist, 400 years just about between the end of Malachi and, and the coming of, of uh, Christ. So that intertestamental period, a lot of history happens and there's fulfillment of some of the prophecies, especially from, from the post-exilic books. But Malachi is extremely important because it is God's final word before the coming of his Messiah and all that goes along with it. Now, so John the Baptist, we, we really see the coming of John as part of the coming of the Messiah because he, he's coming to announce it. So Malachi is uh, God's correction to his people. Uh, he speaks in anticipation of what's coming. Uh, and we're going to take two weeks with this. Uh, and let me just uh, sort of get, go over some things uh, about the book and then we'll take a look at the text. We'll try and do the first two chapters today. So Malachi means my messenger, uh, which may have been the prophet's actual name. I think it is. There are some scholars who believe that that's a pseudonym uh, because some believe that Ezra or uh, somebody uh, else wrote the book and Malachi is just the designation that they served as God's messenger. But I don't think there's any reason to assume that. All Old Testament names have meaning. And just because, uh, the, the, I mean, Malachi would be a pretty generic name, my messenger. Um, and it is both the function of this prophet, but I think also his proper name. Uh, it's dated to around 460 to 430 BC. Uh, it's either just before Nehemiah becomes the governor of Jerusalem or it's during his absence later on. So, but somewhere in that 30 year range. And th so this is about 80 years after Haggai and Zechariah uh, spurred the people on to rebuild the temple. So we've studied those books. This goes another about eight decades later and the disillusionment has set in. They have been told to rebuild the temple uh, and they, they fulfilled that, but the temple doesn't look like much. It's not really, uh, there's just, life is hard. And so here they've come back from exile with all this expectation we're going to be back in the promised land. And they get back there and uh, things are, are just so bad. Uh, the, like questions like property ownership. Okay, so we've been, we were gone 70 years. Other people, in essence, squatted on the land that we know our grandparents owned. So how, what do you do? I mean, there's really one thing to do, and that's you drive them off, off your property, well, but that means people get killed, and that's hard. So the, the Israelites, they come up with a, a really a creative solution, and that's let's marry their daughters. And instead of fighting for their land, they intermarry with the people. Well, that sets up a whole other set of problems because now you're, you're marrying pagan daughters to your sons and they're going to have their false gods. And so you make compromises about how we worship. So all that, that is happening. Times are hard. The promised prosperity doesn't seem to have been realized. The people tended to feel like 
the prophets were feeding them a line. Oh, you know, if you obey God, things are going to be better. And so God's a bit of a letdown. Uh, this showed an increasingly casual attitude to worship and the standards that God had given them. Uh, basically, the people are feeling like, well, God didn't keep his end of the bargain. And they think that obedience is something that God has to earn. God has to deserve our obedience. And he's not done the things that we think he should have done. So therefore, we're really not worried about keeping his law. Now, I would suggest to you that's a pretty common attitude people have all the time. I, I'll never forget the conversation I had with a couple years and years ago when I pastored in Lexington. A couple comes in and they begin to share with me all the problems that they've had and different things that have happened. And then when they finish this litany, uh, this catalog of terrible things that God had allowed in their lives, they leaned forward and they looked at me and they said, and pastor, we tithe. And I, I realized in that moment that it's what I call the Godfather view of God. It's like, you know, you do me a favor, I'll do you a favor. And I'm doing God a favor by tithing and this is protection money. Uh, and God, you know, I've been paying you this money and you're not protecting me from the bad stuff that happens in life. What a pitiful view of God that is. Uh, who did Jesus say is the greatest man? born of woman, John the Baptist. And what happened to John the Baptist? He got his head cut off. Now, do you think God kept his promise to John the Baptist? Yes. Read the book, Hebrews chapter 11. It gives us all this list of these great heroes of the faith. And then it says this in verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised. I don't even know what Bible people are reading because the Bible is so clear and so honest about this that the promises of God are ultimate blessings and promises and God does not deal with everybody uniformly in this life and in this world. Uh, does he love Chinese Christians or Cuban Christians less than he loves American Christians because he's given us more stuff? Is that evidence that he loves us more? Of course not. We, I think intellectually we all know that, but down deep there's something in us that just sort of thinks that God's blessing on us is the stuff he gives us and whether or not he keeps us from getting cancer. I mean, you just go in the average Southern Baptist Sunday school class on any given Sunday and you go around the room and say, tell me how God has blessed you. And what comes out of people's mouth is the stuff God has given them. Oh, God has blessed me with this stuff. And he's been so good to give me all this stuff. I've got our house is so nice and I've got a boat and a vacation home. And it's the list of the stuff. And so when we, when we lose the stuff or when we lose our health, suddenly we go, hey, God, I, I don't understand why you've done this. I mean, I'm doing my part down here. And so when God disappoints us, how do we treat his law and his commands? We say, well... If he's not going to take care of me, I'm, even, I'm not going to do that stuff. And so it really reveals the heart behind it all along was never we're doing it out of love. We're never doing it out of uh, a passion to honor God. We're doing it because we want God to do something for us. That At the heart, even of our obedience, there can be really selfishness, wickedness, sinfulness, and you see that here in Malachi. This is what Malachi is dealing with a lot. So his message about God's claim on his people was needed then and it's needed today, uh, 25 centuries later. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Malachi. So his name means my messenger. Uh, some people think that this is Ezra or Haggai or Mordecai, but uh, I, again, I don't think so. I think it's a this, that name, that designation is not used elsewhere in any other of the books. None of those guys call themselves God's messenger, so I think it's a proper name. Malachi is a strong character. He strongly opposed all the people who are indifferent to the temple. You know, they're, the Jews that are there going like, ah, you know, we don't really need that. It's not worth the sacrifice. It's not worth 
our, our giving to it, our efforts for it, and Malachi strongly opposes them. He is a reformer on fire with a religious spiritual zeal. Uh, he wants the people to worship Yahweh. Uh, he's probably influenced heavily by Nehemiah. Uh, Nehemiah comes back and Nehemiah uh, emphasizes righteousness and godliness. Nehemiah would have been a contemporary uh, with Malachi. And so I think Malachi is, so if you think of Nehemiah, Nehemiah is not a prophet. He's a, he's a worker that God has raised up. He's a leader God raises up to do the task. And think of Malachi then as the prophet that God raises up for the spiritual uh, leadership while Nehemiah is leading uh, in particular efforts. Uh, so the, the, temple was, the temple was rebuilt and dedicated in 516 B.C. Nehemiah comes uh, some 60 years later, uh, in, uh, 70 years later in 445 B.C., uh, and there, there, so there's like six decades where the record is completely silent. We, we don't know everything that happened in that time. Uh, we know from secular history, world events, like during that time, Darius, so Darius ruled the Persian Empire from 521 to uh, 485. Then Xerxes follows him. Xerxes is called Ahasuerus in the Bible. That's Esther's husband. He rules from uh, 485 to 465. Then Artaxerxes becomes uh, the king of Persia, and he reigns from 465 to 435. And during this time, the Greek empire begins to rise. Philip of Macedon, Alexander's father, the Greeks and the Persians begin to lock horns. Persia, uh, for some of you that know the story of Thermopylae and the Spartan band, 300, all that, that happens during that time. Uh, 480 BC is where Thermopylae takes place. The Greeks are trying to take over the Greek, uh, excuse me, the Persians are trying to take over the Greek peninsula. And by the way, at that point, they'd never lost. They'd never lost uh, every country they'd attacked, they defeated. Uh, but the Greeks, who are really a collection of disparate uh, city-states, they get together for this one thing, and that is to fight the Persians, and they, they succeed in, in repelling them. Uh, but Persia doesn't uh, defeat Greece, um, and that, uh, that's what allows sort of the Greek empire to begin with Philip of Macedon, Alexander's father, and then ultimately Alexander the Great. So Persia is losing supremacy through those years. Uh, so that's sort of what's going on in the world. Now, as far as the world scene goes, what's happening in Jerusalem is small potatoes, right? Uh, anybody, you know, you know Herodotus uh, and Thucydides, these great historians, they're not talking about Jerusalem. Jerusalem's irrelevant. Jerusalem's a little outpost on the backside of nowhere. Uh, whatever glory it once had is long gone when it was destroyed by uh, Nebuchadnezzar uh, and all the way back in 586 and so now this little ragtag bunch of Jews coming back from the Persian Empire to rebuild stuff it's, it's, not, it's not on the world uh, scene at all they, people just don't give a rip about it because it's so inconsequential but I want you to, to think how heaven sees it is very, very different. So you got this, the world struggle for domination, the Greek empire the, uh, that is rising, the Persian empire that is waning, uh, battle for what was, what's really the Western world, but uh, really, as they say, the winners are the ones who write history, and the Western world is certainly dominant in, at that time. And... And yet God is looking down from heaven on his people. And what matters to him is his care of them and their worship of him, his relationship with them. And they are so lost in 
the, the hardship of life that they lose sight of who God is. So this is why he sends Malachi. Uh, the situation in Jerusalem is bad. The people are indifferent to spiritual things. They have no prophet. Nehemiah comes back from Persia. Uh, he's allowed by Darius to come back and rebuild the walls of the city in spite of opposition. But the crops are poor. Uh, the priests are corrupt. The people complain against God. They refuse to tithe. Uh, social injustice abounds. They take advantage of the poor and widows and orphans and strangers in the land and even their own wives. Mixed marriages are common, and I don't mean that ethnically so much as I mean that spiritually. Uh, there's a way, like Boaz marrying Ruth or uh, Salmon marrying uh, Rahab. There's a way for a Jewish man to marry uh, a Gentile who will convert. That's not what they're doing. They're, they're intermarrying and allowing their wives to remain in their religion. And they do this really just to get, their, get property. And so they're, they're even divorcing their Jewish wives in order to marry women that are property owners. And so there's all kinds of, uh, of social injustice. Leagues have been formed with other nations for economic deliverance. And, you know, they're trusting in other nations to deliver them instead of God. And so this is why God raises up Malachi. Now, uh, think of this book. These are not individual sermons. It's sort of open air preaching uh, and then questions. So Malachi begins to just, he goes out in public and he begins to preach and to prophesy to his nation and he accuses them. He throws out accusations about how they've been in sin. And they'll answer back, now, how have we done that? We haven't done that. And Malachi will then say, oh, here's how you, you've done it. And uh, so, so there are things that are some of the major things that are covered in this book. God's love for Israel. That's the theme of chapter one we're going to look at today. Uh, and then the arguments against those who deny God's love and justice is from chapter 2, verse 17, really through the rest of the book. Um, so uh, let's, let's just get right into uh, chapter 1, and then we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the, the, some of the, the themes and how the book breaks down. Uh, let's read beginning verse 1 of Malachi 1. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Okay, now this is, uh, th this, this is a, a, a common human trait. You know where else we see this in the Old Testament? Gideon, uh, one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Gideon is, remember the first time Gideon shows up in the book of Judges. So that's before, that's before God's the kingdom of Israel set up. And this is after. And you see at both ends, people are asking this question. Gideon is, is uh, threshing wheat in the wine press, which means uh, he's, he's not where he's supposed to be. You don't thresh wheat in a wine press. You always thresh wheat at a threshing floor, which is up on a hill where you get a breeze. But Gideon is down in the wine press. You always have to have a wine press down by in a valley by running water because you have to have some place to push the skins. Uh, when, that, when you've tread out the, the grapes, the, what's left, a solid waste, has to be pushed out into running water so it's carried away or else you're just going to have a bunch of flies and stink uh, around you all the time. And so wine press is always down in the valley by running water, threshing floors up on a hill. Here's Gideon down in a wine press trying to thresh wheat and there's no breeze down there. And he's hiding from the Midianites because the Midianites will steal his wheat and kill him. And he's scared to death. And suddenly the angel of the Lord shows up and he says, Hail, mighty man of valor. I mean, it's, to me, it's one of the funniest lines in the Bible because there is nothing that, uh, about Gideon that shows that he's a mighty man of valor. But the angel calls him that. 
And Gideon's first response, I mean, I would ask you, what's your response if an angel shows up and says something like that to you? I mean, uh, other places in the Bible, people bow down and the angel says, no, get up. Uh, but there's none of that for Gideon. He doesn't, not only does he not bow down, he's not impressed. He responds by saying, why is God letting all this stuff happen to us? Where's God? Why? God doesn't love us. And it's, it's an accusation against God. The first thing out of Gideon's mouth to the angel. And then the angel tells him God's chosen him and he wants a sign. You know, like what more of a sign do you want than a nine foot angel showing up outside your door? That's a pretty good sign. But uh, he, you know, he, he just doesn't trust God. That's Gideon's big issue. And here you see it all the way at the end. So that's sort of the beginning of the story of Israel in the book of Judges. Here we are in the last book of the Old Testament. They're still saying the same thing. Why doesn't God love us? Why does all this bad stuff happen? If we're God's chosen people, why, tell him to choose somebody else because life is hard here and we don't think God loves us. And, and uh, look, how, look at God's answer. Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to the jackals of the desert. If Edom says, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says, they may build, but I will tear down. And they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this and you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. All right, let's, uh, let's talk about this because this is, uh, this is difficult theology for some people. Uh, first of all, let, let's not project on God our image of who we think God should be. Let's let God speak for himself and let's let the Bible bear witness of who God is. This is his revelation of himself. Is it true that God loves everybody? Well, it's certainly true. And again, that, that depends on definitions always. It's certainly true that God is gracious to everybody. God loves his creation. God is gracious to everybody, causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. But the Bible is also very clear that God says that he, he is angry with the wicked every day, that he has set his, uh, his heart against those who oppose him. And the Old Testament is full of references to those people and especially people groups that opposed and even hurt God's people and even though God may have used them to chastise his children, God still then holds them responsible for what they did. So we know this from Babylon. That's what the book of Habakkuk is about. Babylon was getting stronger and stronger. And the prophet Habakkuk knew that they're going to be trouble for us down the road. God's letting them get stronger and his people are getting weaker Habakkuk doesn't get that, and, and he, he questions God about it, and God tells him, well, I'm doing that. I'm raising up Babylon, and I'm going to use them to chastise my people, but then I'm going to deal with Babylon. The same thing is true with the Edomites. Now, the Edomites, that word Edom is uh, the word for red. It's a cognate word for the word Esau. Esau also means red, so Esau the red-headed brother of Jacob was the oldest. Remember, he was born first of the twins. They're twins, and Esau was born first. Uh, and he is uh, uh, the, he's the one that has the right of inheritance because he's the first one to break the womb. But God chooses Jacob. God said that before they were born that Jacob was going to be the child of promise. God was still good to Esau. Genesis 36 is a long list of just the descendants of Esau. And it shows how good God is to Esau because in the ancient world, how do you measure wealth? You measure wealth by flocks and herds, 
land, property, if, if indeed you own property, that's a big thing. Not a lot of people own property. Uh, they were more like nomads and Bedouins. And then wives and children, grandchildren. And Genesis 36 is a lengthy description of all the wealth of Esau. He's got wives and children and grandchildren. He gets his own country, the land of Edom. Meanwhile, where's Jacob? Where does Jacob live? God gives Jacob the land of Canaan. Does Jacob ever get it? No, he never gets it. He lives in a tent. Hebrews 11 says that he dwelled in a tent along with his father Isaac and his grandfather Abraham. They spent their whole lives in a tent. Now, these are the ones to whom God said, I'm going to give you that land as far as you can see, wherever your foot treads, from the north to the south, the east and the west, I'm giving you that land. And yet Hebrews 11 very honestly says they died in faith, not having received the things promised. Meanwhile, Esau, the one that God says, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I, what? Hated, strong word. He gets his own country. Uh, he is very wealthy, very powerful. Now, if you were to look at the lives of these two men, Jacob who walks with a limp, whose life is marked by bad decision after bad decision and tragedy after tragedy. And then here's, here's Esau, gets his own country, all this fabulous wealth. Which one of those would you say God has favored? Now to look at them, most Christians would say, well, man, God really favored Esau. And look at Jacob. He, he must be living in sin because... He's living in a tent. God's not blessing him. He's got lots of enemies and his sons are very disobedient and cause a lot of trouble. And then there's Esau, gets his own country. He's gone on the other side of the Jordan and he's got the what you and I call modern day Jordan. That all belongs to to Esau. And yet, if you follow them, follow it down through the centuries, over and over, God prophesies, he raises up prophets. And they prophesy against Edom. There comes a time when Israel is destroyed by its enemies that the Edomites cheer and they even help a little bit. And God through one of his prophets says to them, said, I'm, I'm watching that and I'm taking note and the day's going to come. You who said, you who said, raise it, raise it or destroy it, destroy it. I'm going to destroy you. And here God says this. You Israelites think you've got it so rough. I've been tough on you. He said, I've loved you. They said, well, how have you loved us? Life is hard here. He says, no, you want to see, you want to see what it looks like when I don't love you? Look over there across the Jordan at Edom and see how I have destroyed Edom and I have allowed their enemies to just run rampant over them. And if they should ever try and rebuild the country, I'll do it again. That's what it looks like when I'm against you. And uh, there, are no, there are no Edomites today. And yet the descendants of Abraham are still with us. God was very clear. I love you, but I'm not, that, I'm not gonna behave the way you think I should behave. My love isn't gonna look to you like you always think it should. But if you want to see my wrath, look at Edom. Jacob have I loved. Esau have I hated. All along I said I would make the older serve the younger. Esau rebelled against that. Esau tried to get the birthright back, but I've given it to Jacob. And uh, that's what my love looks like. I'm, it's not that I don't allow you to go through difficult times. But if you want to see my wrath, look at Edom. Because when I am against you, 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 can't, you can't survive it. So God says, don't, don't misunderstand. You can't interpret my love by your expectation of actions. And uh, he's great is, he said, uh, your own eyes shall see this and you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. In other words, God says, I'm doing things that go beyond just my dealing with you. <coughs> I'm... I'm at work in actions in the world. Israel seems insignificant. 
But the reality is I'm as much as, I am as at work in Israel as I am anywhere else in the world and I am at work in the world as I am in Israel. I'm in control of it all. Verse six, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear, says the Lord of hosts to you, O priest. Now you're gonna see that the first, much of the first two chapters is God's word to the priest because the spiritual leaders of, of the people are being disobedient and they are dishonoring the Lord. And so God's going to deal with him first. You know, there's the principle in the book of Leviticus that like if a priest sins, the offering that the priest has to offer for his sin is equivalent to if the whole congregation of Israel sins. It's just God showing us that the sin of a leader is great. It's why James says, don't everybody desire to be a teacher because if you are a teacher, uh, you're going to be held to a, a stricter, a harsher judgment. What does Jesus say? Jesus says that if you teach one of these little ones wrong, it would be better for you for a millstone to be tied around your neck and you to be cast into the sea. In other words, the judgment on those that take leadership lightly and teach people wrongly is going to be great. And uh, here he addresses the priest first. He says, uh, if I'm a master, where's my fear, says the Lord of hosts, to you, O priest, who despise my name. But you say, how, how have we despised your name? What do you mean? These priests would have been very orthodox. They would have, I mean, if you'd questioned them theologically, their theology would have been straight. They, if they were reading the text of the Torah and they came to the name Yahweh, they would have said Adonai. They would, they would not have even said the name of the Lord. They would claim that they had reverence for the name of God. How have we despised your name? He says, by offering polluted food upon my altar. The capacity of the human heart to assume that we please God is, um, is really unending. It is infinite. We, we like to pat ourselves on the back. You know what? I, 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 get, I get people talk to me all the time and they get focused on one thing that that's the thing that's destroying Christianity or America or whatever. And sometimes I hear that, I go like, really? I mean, you think that's the thing? And, so, and we're like the priest. Well, I don't do this. I don't do that. But we say, oh, but man, people who do that, now that's the bad thing. And here are the priest that they are convinced they're doing things right that they are representing the Lord to the people and the people to the Lord. And God says, you've despised my name. How have, we, how have we despised your name? And they would have listed all the things that they're doing right. But he says, by offering polluted food on my altar. Now you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? Now look, what, look, look at God's complaint to them. His complaint is not that they're not giving sacrifice. It's that when they give sacrifice, they're giving him what they can afford to give. Like now, we got this, bland, this blind lamb and we don't want that polluting the flock. We don't, we're not going to use that lamb to breed. Uh, so we'll offer that. We'll sacrifice that to the Lord. When we go to the temple, that's what we'll take. Now, you know, what, what does a, the sacrifice of a lamb, what's the requirement of the lamb? It's to be a lamb without spot or blemish. And so here, instead of giving the Lord their best, they're giving the Lord what they don't want. It's not that they're not 
sacrificing. It's not that they're not offering anything. It's that they're offering what they can afford. They're offering what they really don't want to keep. It's the mentality that says, well, uh, what? let me just look over what I have and what can I give that doesn't cost me much? What can I give that doesn't hurt m- me or my wealth any? And God says, look at, hey, what, look at the verbs God uses. You've despised my name. You're offering polluted food. Uh, you're, you're, when you do that, you're making the Lord's table, what? Despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? So God is looking not at what we give. God's looking at what we keep. So it's not that they're not giving. God's saying, yeah, but look, you, you're keeping better things for you. You're looking lightly on what you provide for me. And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor? So you just, you just want to give that to an official. Uh, If you gave that to an official, would you take your blind lamb and say to the governor, here, I want to give you this as an, A token of my esteem for you. You would not do that. And if you did, do you think you'd get any favors from him? Why, he'd mark you as someone who's insulting him. You wouldn't do that to another human being. Why would you do that to me? Uh, And now entreat the favor of God, verse 9, that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? I mean, Honestly, do do you think that I'm going to respond to you treating the sacrifice lightly? Now, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? Why does God care about this? Because, remember, this is a picture of Jesus. This is a picture of Jesus. Every time they offer a sacrifice, that is a portrait of what Christ is going to do. It's like saying... God is allowing me to see now in a type what he's going to do in his son, the Messiah. So when I offer this sacrifice, I'm picturing God's offering of his perfect, sinless son. And if you're giving something that is blind or lame or sick, you've broken the picture. You, I mean, I, I, uh, I used to have this, this fake picture in my wallet that I carried around for years, and it was just it was a picture of, of just a, a very, very homely woman, uh, and not anybody real, or that I knew anyway to be real, but I had this picture in my wallet, and I'd carry it around, and I'd talk to people about my lovely wife, Tanya, and ev- eventually I'd, get, I knew, I'd bait them, so they'd say, well, do you have a picture of her? And I said, oh, I do. And I'd pull out that picture and show it to them. And, and it, just to watch people's reaction was funny. Uh, I remember one uh, African-American uh, pastor friend of mine, when I pulled that out and showed it to him, he looked at it, he goes, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> and I, I, and uh, I thought that was, a, you know, I, I, he still, I saw him a few months ago in Atlanta. He pastors in Dallas now. And he, he, he remembered that event. That's 21 years ago. And uh, he said, man, I thought that guy really does love that woman. I mean, if he thinks she's beautiful, he, uh, that is genuine love. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, I, I quit doing that for a lot of reasons. But uh, one is that uh, Tanya got tired of it. So <laughs> what was I doing? I was distorting the picture. I was saying, oh, this is my wife. And that, that wasn't in any way my wife. It didn't remotely resemble my wife. Uh, and I was doing it for humor, but imagine uh, that, in fact, let's be honest. Uh, if you have any sense at all, you got a Facebook account. Before you post a picture of your wife, what do you do? You ask her. You show it to her. And like, you mind if I post this? Because, you know, we all could take 
unflattering pictures and unflattering moments and poses and your eyes half closed and all that and just they're just bad pictures no, no, no wife wants that to be put up on Facebook as like this is my wife you know trying to get her at her worst moments I mean she wants you to picture her as beautiful and you want she wants to be captured at her best moments now if a earthly human person wants that how much more do you think God wants that for the picture of his son he, he wants the sacrifice to accurately picture his son. And God takes breaking or distorting the picture very seriously. Where have we seen in the Bible where someone broke God's picture and God got very angry? Uh, Moses, when God told Moses to speak to the rock, what is he? He's, he's already pictured that the Messiah would be smitten because he had Moses hit the rock one other time. But now he wants to picture something else. And he commands Moses to speak to the rock. What does Moses do? In his anger, he hits the rock. Uh, Must we bring you water from this rock, you rebels? And he gets angry and he hits the rock not once but twice. Okay, now that twice, that breaks the picture too. And so what does God do? Okay, Moses, for this, what, what I think all of us would consider a minor infraction compared to a lot of other bad stuff. But for that, God said, you're not going into the promised land. And he allows Moses to die and he buries him on Nebo in sight of the promised land without ever entering it until the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, but you think God takes that very, very seriously. What's the Lord's Supper? Is it not a picture of what Christ has done for us? And what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 11? When he's talking to them about uh, despising the church, he says, despise you, the church of God. And, he, and the way that they have broken the picture, he says, you eat and drink to yourselves, damnation, judgment. And because of this, many are sick and some even sleep some are dead this is why sometimes people ask me you know i have students all the time at southern when i teach in my pastoral ministry class about what to say when you serve communion i have guys say aren't you worried about hurting somebody's feelings i said no i'm worried about them being killed that's a that's a lot bigger worry and i i, I know when you say that some people think oh how quaint I just take the text seriously. The text says you dare not do that lightly. And I'm, I'm just going to preach it exactly the way the Holy Spirit put it there. God takes breaking his picture seriously. And when, I mean, when uh, God wants to picture his power in the book of Acts and the seven sons of Sceva, uh, they want that power or Simon Magus, he wants that power. And what, what, man, what happens is always very, very serious. We need to take God's picture lightly. I'm going to preach in just a few moments from Ephesians 5. What's the big deal about marriage? It's the picture of the gospel. It's the picture of Christ's love for his church and the church's submissive response to Christ. And there's a lot more at stake than your happiness. And we need to be aware of that. We need to understand what God is doing and God's anger that they are breaking his picture by offering sacrifices that do not picture Christ. They distort what God intends. Uh, he says, uh, verse 10, Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. He said, I, I wish somebody would just shut the doors and let nobody come in. It's better for you to not offer sacrifice than to do that, to break the picture. No, no picture at all is better than a distorted picture. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, 
And in every place, incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering for not, my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you, now you, I want you to get this emphasis. God says, I'm going to make my name great among the nations. There's going to be incense offered to me from every place. And I expect this from the entire world. But you, you are the ones to whom I've given the oracles, the law, the commandments, my prophets. You know this first and better than anyone. And you do not give me what I have commanded you. Uh, you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit, that is its food may be despised. You know, just offer what you have. All that matters is your heart as you offer it. Now, we can, we can shine it up. We can put all kinds of spiritual talk around it. God says, no, there's something more important here than, than your sweetheart as you offer it. You've got to keep the picture. Uh, you, you profane it otherwise. But you say, what a weariness this is. What a weariness this is. And you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. Now, I, I must pause and ask you, are you ever guilty of treating service to the Lord as a weariness? Oh, man, it would sure not be nice to have a Sunday morning where I could just lay in bed. and I work so hard. What a weariness it is to get up and go to church. What a, what a weariness it is to be a part of a community group and to, you know, Somebody has a need. God, do we always have to fix these funeral meals? I mean, we just, we fall into that way of thinking that serving the Lord is a weariness. What a weariness this is. You snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick. So you, you, you steal somebody else's offering and offer it. Uh, or you bring what's lame or sick, something you don't want, and this you bring as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. Man, isn't that what we do? We, oh, yeah, I'm going to do this for the Lord. I'm going to give the Lord my best. Oh, I'm going I'm, I'm to dedicate this to the Lord. So you have a child uh, and boy at birth, you say, Lord, I want you to be glorified in my child. I, I want you to use my child for the Lord, for your glory. As that child grows, maybe he's great at athlete, as, as an athlete or he's got an incredible mathematical mind and whatever his natural gifts are, you pride yourself in that, but you don't shape it for the Lord's glory. You just make it all about accomplishment and attainment, and there's no surrendering it to the Lord. There's no priorities. It takes precedence over everything else in your life, any spiritual emphasis. And you began by saying, oh, I want my child to glorify the Lord, but before long you're living vicariously through your child about their accomplishments and attainments. Now, I've seen that repeated a thousand times in in my ministry. It's just a real common thing. We start with one intention. Oh, I want the Lord to be glorified in this. But man, then it's like once we sort of succeed at the thing we do, we, we're going to devote to the Lord, well, then it's like it's harder for us to give it to him. Well, God says that's a curse. I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts. And my name will be feared among the nations. God says, I, I deserve this glory. And now, O priest, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them <clears throat> because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your offspring and spread dung on your faces, the dung of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. So shall you know that I have sent this command to you. 
that my covenant with Levi may stand, says the Lord of hosts. Okay, so the priests are dishonoring the Lord uh, and uh, God commands them that because they have been willing to offer offerings that are blemished, because they've been complicit with the people in this, they've told people that they can offer that, they've not sort of built the fence as it were to tell people, no, you can't bring that here, you can't offer that, you need to bring your best. They've been complicit. God says, okay, now I'm going to, I'm going to curse you. Uh, and he says, uh, first he's cursed their, their seed, their descendants. Dung upon the face is an expression of the greatest contempt in the ancient world. He's going to expose them to shame before the people as they had exposed his name to shame in their contemptible sacrifices. So their, their holy days will be as awful to him as dung. And he'll even remove them by death. Uh, he says, uh, and you shall be taken away with it. Verse four, so shall you know that I have sent this commandment to you that my covenant with Levi may stand. The basis of God's covenant with Levi uh, is from the time of Moses. Uh, and in the Aaronic priesthood, he established the law that this is what they're supposed to do. And remember, when God divided up the land among the tribes, so we talk about the 12 tribes, you have to understand, remember there are actually 13 tribes. Uh, there are 13 tribes of Israel. So Joseph gets two. Uh, his two sons uh, each get a, an inheritance. So the Levites don't get any land. And what is it that they get? Here's what God says. He says, I'm not giving you any land because I will be your portion. I will be your portion. Did the Levites get cheated? Now think about it. Everybody else gets land. What do the Levites get? They get God. God says, I will be your portion. Uh, he, he does put six cities around Israel that are called the cities of refuge. The Levites can live in them. And they can live at the tabernacle or at, later at the temple. Uh, but they don't get land per se. And the, the nation is supposed to care for the Levites through the sacrifices and through their offerings, the temple tax and things. They care for the Levites. But the Levites are living a life of faith that God is going to care for them and provide for them. And they get to spend their lives devoted to God in the service of the Lord. And so God's gift to the Levites is that they get him and they don't have to fool with crops and, and sowing and reaping and they don't need to worry about the weather. Everybody else in the agrarian society has to take care of that. But you Levites, you just get to devote yourself to me. And yet what have they done? He says, well, you've, you've broken that covenant. My covenant with him was one of life and peace. And I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth. This was my design for the priest. And no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness. And he turned many from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge and people should seek instruction from his mouth for he's the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Now, let me just say as an aside here, it's easy for us in this New Testament age to read this and go, okay, he's talking about preachers. This would apply to preachers. Oh, no, no. Who are the priests in the New Covenant? All believers, every single believer. We are all priests. We're a kingdom of priests that we should show forth his praise. So all of us are to live like this. Uh, in the new covenant, it says that no longer will a man have to say, know the Lord, because they'll all know me from the least of them to the greatest. So we're in that new covenant age. And so what the priest said, what the priest spoke, the truth that the priest conveyed in the Old Testament is now the province of all believers 
because we're all priests. Verse 8, but you have turned aside from the way. You've caused many to stumble by your instruction. You've corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. And so I make you despised and abased before all the people inasmuch as you do not keep my ways, but show partiality in your instruction. And uh, we do this. We, we show partiality. We, we pick and choose the part of God's word that we want to obey. I mean, it's just, uh, if I can be real candid, it's just amazing as I preach through Ephesians, uh, man, I, I preach that part on being filled with the spirit um, or the doxological uh, passage at the end of chapter three and people say, oh man, that's great. Yes, I want to be filled with the spirit. Okay, what's that being filled with the spirit look like? Well, it looks like wives submitting and husbands having loving leadership. We go, oh, oh that's, that's, uh, that. That's not what I meant. And we pick and choose. We say, well, you know, I'm all about that part about taking care of the poor uh, as long as that means somebody else doing it. Uh, we, we, you know, we just, there's parts of scripture that we are comfortable with and parts that we're not. Why well, I'm cutting in and out. Uh, but uh, we've got to understand that it's all the word of God. And when we, when we pick and choose, we're causing others to stumble. Verse nine, so I make you despise and abase before all the people inasmuch as you do not keep my ways, but show partiality in your instruction. Have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another? So he said, look at the way you treat each other. You, you, you all say you're my people and you have God as your father. Well, why do you treat each other this way? Prove, profaning the, cover, the covenant of our fathers. Judah has been faithless and abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob any descendant of the man who does this, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. He said, okay, so here you are in Judah. Judah, of course, the tribe in which Jerusalem is located. Uh, David is the lion of the tribe of Judah. So, right, so, uh, here, and here in Judah, what are you doing? You're profaning the covenant by marrying these daughters of pagans who worship false gods. You know, it's, uh, I had several people tell me after a couple weeks ago when I, I preached the text on wives submitting and, but there's just nothing that's going to divide true Bible believing Christians from those that want to posture that way than a text like that. And several parents told me that the conversations that they had, especially with their teenage daughters after that, was the daughters were saying, well, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't think when I get married, I'm really going to have to submit. Oh, well, man, this is why you better choose a man that you trust enough that you can submit to. Because if you marry someone, let's say a, a believer marries an unbeliever, well, uh, first of all, what, what did Jesus, who does Jesus say, if you're not a, a believer, who's your father? Jesus said, you're of your father, the devil. All right, so a believer marries an unbeliever. Guess who you've got for a father-in-law? The devil's your father-in-law. You're always going to have in-law problems. Uh, and, you know, you're, a believer's going to want to go to church. A unbeliever ain't going to want to do that. A believer's going to want to tithe. And an unbeliever ain't going to want to just give money away. A believer is going to want to rear their children a certain way. An unbeliever is going to share that passion. I mean, it's just setting up for failure from the get-go. And this is what they're doing. They're, they're claiming to be the priest that worship the Lord. And yet they are leading the people in being unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And he said, verse 13, this second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears and weeping and groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. 
But you say, why does he not? Oh, why can't we see? Oh, I remember years ago we go to church revival for two and three weeks and God would greatly move and the altar be filled with people weeping and why can't we see that anymore because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless though she is your companion and your wife by covenant now look at this did he not make them one with a portion of the spirit in their union now this is the Hebrew of this is a little strange, and I'm going to disagree with the ESV translators here. If you've got an ESV that I'm preaching from, you'll notice the word spirit is capitalized. And that means they're saying that they, they're taking it that God uh, had a portion of the Holy Spirit in the union of husband and wife. Well, that's true enough, but I don't think that's what this passage is saying. I say take that capital S off the front of that. And translate this, it's the, it's the Hebrew word ruach, which can be translated as spirit or wind or breath. As in, and God breathed into Adam the, the breath of life and man became a living soul. So here he's talking about that original union when God created Adam and Eve. And he says... How many wives did God make for Adam? He made one. And he said that those, how many? Two should be one flesh. Now, when he made them one, did he not have breath left over? Could he not have made a second wife for Adam if he had wanted to? That's what he's saying in this passage. He said, did he not make them one with a literally, the, the King James, I think here says a residue, and that's a good translation. Residue, something left over. Did he make them one with a residue of breath in their union? He had breath left over. He could have made another wife. He could have made marriage impermanent. He could have made marriage a, a thing of convenience he could have done that but what did he do he said they too shall be one flesh a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh and how long does that what God has joined together do not let man put asunder and he said you have broken faith with the wife of your youth because now you've come into the land and it's more convenient for you to get land back by marrying one of these pagan daughters and so you're putting you're divorcing your wife in order to marry another woman or else you're just adding her to it and you're having two wives he said God could have made that the design had he wanted to do that that was within God's power to do it but that's not what he did he made the two one and God joined them together for life and what was God seeking why did God do that because he's seeking godly offspring. Now, I would just point out, every time you see polygamy in the Old Testament, and it was widely practiced, you see problems with the kids in every one of them. I mean, there's always fighting among them in the family and grabbing for who gets time with dad and the, which, which wife is the favorite. It's horrible. So don't think just because the Bible accurately describes something that the Bible is telling us that it was okay. I mean, polygamy, slavery, those things are clearly taught and they're, they're shown to us in the Bible. They existed in the Bible. But what was God's design? Was that part of God's design? That wasn't anything that happened before the fall. That's stuff that happened after the fall. That's what man did in his sinful state after the fall. It's Malachi calling us back to. He's calling us back to God's design. So guard yourselves in your spirit. Let none of you be faithless with the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit. Do not be faithless. He's saying you better 
Well, notice his use of the word spirit. Guard yourself in your spirit. That you don't break faith with the wife of your youth. God has given her to you. God joined you together. You keep the covenant with her. Don't leave her because it's more convenient and makes better sense economically for you to marry someone else. You keep the covenant with her because that's part of your covenant as God's people with him. Malachi's, man, he's in their faces, isn't he? And uh, we'll, we'll let him get it back in our grill again next week, okay?